Yo, what's up everybody, how you doing? Welcome to the first video for Smoking Phoenix Cigars and Conversation. Today though, this video will go wide into my Lorenzo Reed YouTube channel, Facebook page, as well as Coach Renz. And I wanna thank everybody for joining. Please subscribe to Smoking Phoenix Cigars and Conversations. Today we are in the first location of Smoking Phoenix Cigars, which is 5385 Five Force Trickham Road, Suite D2, D2, in Lilburn, Georgia. But the address actually is Stone Mountain, but you can find us in Lilburn either way. But I want to thank everybody for joining me, joining me for this conversation. One of the reasons why this video is going to go wide is because of the subject matter in itself. It applies to every channel that I have and everyone that listens. We're going to talk about generational wealth, and it's fitting that we're in a location that Uncle Ren's popcorn is three doors down. And this is Smoking Phoenix Cigar Lounge. And we are talking about generation, building generational wealth, but we're not gonna talk about it in the normal way that most people look forward to. Most of the time you hear people talk about generational wealth, they're talking about buying land, buying and owning your own home. These are good things. They tell you about building a business. That's a good thing as well. They tell you about saving money and investing in stocks. Saving money, sure. Investing in stocks, sure. But how much are you really going to make? I'd rather you build a business than invest in some stocks or put money into saving. Definitely over a 401k. But today, I'm going to tell you guys a secret. A secret of how to truly build generational wealth so that the information, the information is truly how you build generational wealth. The application of that information. And I almost forgot. I can't light up in here. Not yet. Simply because we haven't finished the build out, we haven't got all everything done, and I haven't got my CO, so we can't light up in here yet. But let me tell you what I had earlier today. You might have seen some photos that I took outside. Matter of fact, I post them some of them up here. You'll see the photos that I took outside and getting ready for the marketing, the beginning marketing of Smoking Phoenix Cigar Lounge. This, this is one of my favorite cigars. It's a Crazy Alice, crazy aptly named Crazy Alice. It comes from the Drew Hill Estates Company, where they have a line of cigars that are sweet to the taste. If you like flavored cigars, sweet flavored cigars, and this one is a short stick, so you get about a 20, 30 minute smoke out of it. But it has a nice, sweet tipped flavor that, that you get in every in every puff. You get that, that sweet taste of it. And it's a great cigar for people who they're, they're not too much into the tobacco taste or the wood taste or the cognacs and uh, different types of other flavorings uh, but this is a good one to offset some of the tobacco taste if you're not uh, a lover of that tobacco taste i love the tobacco taste as well but if you're not a lover of that not a lover of the leather taste then the crazy alice is a good cigar uh, to start with it's a mild cigar it's a mild one so you're if you're first first starting you might want to get something a little bit lighter first, but you can start out with this one. Always remember, a cigar is different from a cigarette. You do not inhale. You do not inhale. And just to let you know, you want to have something to eat before or during the smoking of your cigar. You want to have something to drink before and during the smoking of your cigar. You see, your cigar will burn the sugar out of your blood, and because it's burning that sugar, that's why people start to feel queasy because they don't have any sugar flowing through their system. So you need that sugar. A great sugar to have though is chocolate. The reason why you wanna have chocolate is because chocolate is also going to reset your palate. So that when you're eating the chocolate and smoking your cigar, what that's going to do for you is allow for you to retaste the cigar, especially if you're not ready for a retro inhale. You want to taste the cigar over and over again have some chocolate with you, little pieces of chocolate. We'll have chocolate in and, out, in and about Smoking Phoenix Cigar Lounge, but you wanna have that with you. Also, if you're changing drinks, if you're drinking one thing and then you wanna drink something else, you're gonna get a different flavor from the cigar depending upon what you're drinking. So a piece of chocolate will reset that palate so that you're good to go for that next drink to get that different flavor. So this Crazy Alice, it's a great, mild, sweet tasting cigar. It's one of my favorites to have when I'm on a short car ride with the top down. So y'all, and get your crazy Alice and come to the Smoking Phoenix Cigar Lounge when we open. I'll let you guys know when the grand opening is. Uh, we'll know more about that in the coming weeks. But 
generational wealth. Let's talk about this for about five, 10 minutes. I'm gonna tell you how to set it up. Back in the late 1800s, many people are focused on the Rothschild family merely as the conspiracy of one of the ruling families on the planet. But one of the things that we should learn from the Rothschild is how they set up the family bank in order for them to generate wealth for generation after generation. We are clear 200 years past when Mayor Rothschild first, after becoming wealthy, supporting both uh, sides of World War II, after supporting both sides, family became wealthy, they became bankers. They financed the wars. They financed many other uh, enterprises throughout Europe. But one of the things Mayor Rothschild ensured was that the wisdom was passed along from generation to generation. And by setting up the family bank, this is how, that's what he did. And I'm gonna tell you guys how to do it today without having to become wealthy first. But I want you to have the history of it. Let me show you the downfall, the pitfalls of not setting up the family bank. In the late 1800s, right before the turn of the century, the Vanderbilts, Mr. Vanderbilt forgot his first name just that quickly. Uh, it was in my head and it just went away. But uh, he was at that point the richest man in the world, Vanderbilt. I think his name is Cornelius, Cornelius Vanderbilt, I believe. Richest man in the world. Never set up a family bank. Instead, he set up trust funds for his children, colleges, that sort of thing. Generation after generation, the wisdom is not passed down. The testing of the that wisdom is not passed down. So let me say, rephrase. The knowledge is not passed down, and the testing of it so that it is wisdom was not passed down. And so a hundred years later, in the 1970s, when the Vanderbilt family all came together in commemoration or of, I believe, Cornelius Vanderbilt, not one of them at that time frame was a millionaire. A hundred years later, not one is a millionaire. Vanderbilt's wealth would have eclipsed Bill Gates and Warren Buffett's if you aggregated for inflation. But yet, a hundred years later, no one is a millionaire. Now, in the Rothschild family, 200 years later, they have multiple, multiple, multiple millionaires. The Rothschilds are about estimated about 175 members of that family right now through marriage, so the names are not all Rothschilds, but extremely wealthy because they have the family bank system. The Vanderbilts didn't do this. The DuPonts didn't do this. The Mellons didn't do this. The Carnegies somewhat, but not really did this. The Fords somewhat did it. But the Rothschilds have always maintained that wealth in their, fan, in their family. There are a few other families who have always maintained it. Now, after that meeting, up to today, there are only two Vanderbilts who are now millionaires. Two, just two, from the richest family in the world to only two members just being millionaires. That's a sad thing, it's a sad thing. The question was the family bank. So what Mayor Rothschild set up was the fact that his sons had to go out and earn. They have to prove that they can earn. Every year they come together and they discuss and talk about what the family members have earned. Now the way they got their start was that they borrowed money from the family bank. Now the family bank is a trust, is a trust. Now you have to get a lawyer to set this up. You can't go set up a trust unless you are a lawyer. But a lawyer has to set up this trust and you will more than likely have to explain this to your accountant because most accountants do not know how to do this. Now you're going to see advertisements and videos for family banks and if they're talking about through insurance policies, that is a scam to get you to buy insurance. Your insurance policy should never be borrowed against. You should never utilize your insurance policy in that format. So if they're talking about a family bank through insurance, run run. Man, I wish I can light this up. But the family bank is set up through a trust. A trust with a butt ton of money in it. The family members can borrow from the trust. When they want to buy a house, they borrow from the trust. When they want to buy a car, they, borrow, they do it from the trust. When they want to start a business, they borrow from the trust. 
the money they pay, when they pay the money back, they pay it back to the trust with interest. The interest is usually going to be the current market rate. So the trust will always be growing because you bought your house and the money that you're paying, instead of you paying a 30 year mortgage to a mortgage company, to a bank, you are paying it to your family trust and the interest is accumulating. So the trust grows. Now, how do you insure? And this is why you don't use, now here's where life insurance comes in. And this is where you make sure that the family trust never loses itself. Each member of the family who's a part of this trust must have a life insurance policy on them whereas once they pass, the money goes to the trust. That way, if a family member borrows $300,000 and somewhere along the line they default, then you will still reclaim your money when they pass on because you have a million dollar policy on that family member. Whole life policies have a million dollars. Now, the earlier you can put the policy on a family member, the better. Put it on them when they're like one, two, three years old. But I'm gonna tell you how you can start one for us who don't have millions yet. Just giving you the background, the, the foundation right now. So the family members borrow from the trust for everything. Never go to the bank. Your credit don't matter. And every year you come together and you discuss how you made money, what things you learned, so that the information, the knowledge is passed along family member to family member, generation to generation. You may even decide to do business together as family members, but you're passing along that information so that the children grow up knowing that this is how we process, this is how we build, this is how we become wealthier, this is how business is done in the family. Now, if a person defaults, you that person can't borrow money from the bank until they repay that loan that they defaulted. So they get back and either repay it, depending upon how y'all set up your trust, either fully repay or they get back and they have a grace period of you got to get back to six months of payments, one year of on time payments, and now you can borrow from the bank again. But whatever the board sets up, so each trust will have a board, and that board can be set up however you choose. I, I would choose you choose an odd number of people. That way, if someone comes, they want to borrow money from the bank, the board gets together and say yes or no. You need a majority vote. You get the majority vote, then. That's why you need an odd number of people so that the, a majority can always be there and you give them the loan. You set it up, everything is done through paperwork. Make sure there's contracts denoting how much they borrow, what's the payment plan, repayment plan, when their payment starts, start and stop. Now, if you got good family members and somebody gets into a little trouble financially, then what you do is you tell the family member, hey, you come to the board and the board said, we're gonna give you six months. You ain't gotta worry about making a payment. We're gonna give you a year. You ain't gotta worry about, worry about making a payment. That way, you can keep them in the family bank, but of course they can't borrow during that time frame that they are having their payments deferred. Interest still occurring though. So you wanna set that up. That's the difference between a Rothschild and the Vanderbilts, the DuPonts and the uh, Rothschild. That's the difference between all these families. That's the difference. Now sure, you can go out. Many people, I've seen families where they buy their, everyone gets a, they buy them a house when they're 14, a rental property. And that's good, it's a good start. But you're not really fast, fast tracking that generational wealth that way. So let me tell you how you can set this up today, today. And this is how it's being set up in my family. So my family, based on my grandparents, Ada J. Ross and Isabel Ross, who moved from Carrollton to Marietta, had, um, how many children they had? I gotta count them, y'all. Yeah, my mom, my uncle, my uncle, my uncle, my uncle. So they got, they have seven kids, right? Seven kids, and from these seven, these seven kids, we are now about 80, 90 strong in just Cobb County area. Just from that, that the two grandparents, all their children, all their children's children, and children's children, children, we are about 80 strong now. That's a lot of growth. That's a huge family, right? So now not everyone in my family is going to participate in this right now, and that's fine. They'll come along as we grow, as they see it. Sometimes family members gotta see it before they can actually get involved in it. And sometimes you may have to do this with friends. But make sure you do an odd number. So this is how we're setting up. So I've been working with a lawyer right now to set up the trust. Uh, I'm gonna pay for the initial uh, infrastructure. And it's only costing me $1,200 to set up this trust. Well, within the trust, we're gonna set it up. The first three years, 
in order to become a, let me rephrase, in order to become a member of this family bank, for the first three years, you have to pay in $100 a month. $100 a month. Every month. And the next year, whatever inflation is for 2022, if it goes up 2%, 3%, 4%, we're going to add inflation to that $100. So it'd be $102, $104, $105, dollars whatever it is. So the next year, it's $104, 105 And if any new members want to come in, they will put that. That's where they, their starting point will be. They will put that money in every year for three years. What we will do is we will take that first three years. No one is borrowing money for nothing. No one's borrow money. Uh, so the first ones understand they will not borrow money because they're make, we're making an investment into our family, our family's long-term future. They won't bar, be able to borrow money for the first three years because the first three years we're going we're gonna to stack the money but utilize it every couple of months to buy tax lien properties. Tax lien properties. That's a whole nother video of explaining how a tax lien property works. So just su subscribe and you'll get that information uh, later on. But we will buy tax lien properties. The, when the first tax lien properties in Georgia, you have a one year moratorium. When the first tax lien properties come online that we can title those, we will more than likely flip the first seven, eight, nine, ten tax lien properties. We will buy as many as we can over the next three years and we will flip the majority of them. A few that will be promising as far as rent, we will keep them for rental properties, but we will flip. The reason why we're flipping is because we want to build the family bank faster. Because no one will actually be able to borrow money for the first five years of the family bank. The first five years, no one's borrowing any money. Now, after five years, we have flipped home after home after home. The family bank should have a couple of hundred thousand dollars in it. We would have put life insurance policies on the eldest members of my family. So my mother, my aunts, my uncles, we will put life insurance policies on them because of their age. The life insurance policy will probably only be a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars for each one of them somewhere in that neighborhood. And we will put those life insurance policies on them. And so that if, if, and when, well, ain't no if, whenever they pass on from this understanding of consciousness, they will then fund, their, their contribution will be to fund, help fund this family bank even more. Now, when the first members of the family bank sign up, the first seven, when we get the first seven people, those seven will be board members. Those seven will then have in their contract, that one, in their statements, that once they are retired from being a board member, or they pass on themselves, they will determine who the next board member will be from their line. Now, if they decide to choose a different line, that's fine, but it has to be a blood member of the family. It cannot be someone who was married into the family, and so because that married into the family person is not going to be able to choose somebody else who was married, who was a, a, a adjunct to the family. We got, you want to keep it in your family. So they will, we will choose married, bloodline will matter because we will keep it in this Ross family, right? Forever, it will always be part of the Ross family. I'm a read, but it will be always be a Ross family trust. It will be the Ross family name. So we will continue to buy property and we will then continue to buy property that we will rent and rent and rent and build a real, so this, this whole family trust is gonna be backed by three different things. Real estate property, it will also be backed by life insurance, and then it will be backed by family by family members making loans from the family bank. Had a slight interruption, but I lost my spat, my place, so we're just gonna continue on. But yes, guys, that's how pretty much how you set up a family bank. You back it by those three products. Um, yeah, that's what I was saying last. You back it by those three products of life insurance, uh, real estate, and the interest that you're accruing from the family. And guys, you gotta make sure that you pick people who are serious about doing it. And if they don't commit and if something happens in their life and, and they have to stop making their payments, be have a heart about it. Say, okay, well, you, I understand you have to stop now for the next, how long? Three months, four months, five months, and then let them get started again. But they have to make the full commitment. This also shows that they're going to learn, that they're willing, they're committed, right? And 
there is a way there is a way that as the family bank continues to grow that you can pay out dividends to the family that's if you choose but that could become messy so i wouldn't do that what i would do is keep it in a situation where members can borrow from the family bank to build business to buy their homes but you teach them build the business first and let the business take care of your home don't buy the home first but in those initial growth that may be the mindset of the people is to buy their homes and then not everyone is going to want to build a business some people will go to college utilize the family bank to pay for the college you know so if a, if my if we had that if we had started this uh, 20 years ago then when my kids went to college instead of me getting student loans I would have went to the family bank because if we were started 20 years ago we'd have enough money in there to pay college tuition so I would have been responsible for their tuition but through the family bank and I'd be paying back the family bank and not paying back you know the uh, uh, Sally Mae, Fannie Mae's and all them other student loan programs it would have been going straight through the family bank opening it up Smoking Phoenix would have been done through the family bank. You see, you, you see where I'm going? When I bought that Mustang that you saw pictures of, family bank. Uh, the motorcycle I just bought, family bank. You do all those things through your family bank so that you're building your family and you're building generational wealth because then if we'd have started 20 years ago, my children would have already, that would have been the mode. They would have known that every year there's this big family picnic event uh, cruise whatever and during the, this event we spend two three days discussing business and how, what we've accomplished and how things move they would have known that from childhood so as adults that would have been an automatic as much as it is for some families it's an automatic for the kids to go to college because every other family member went to college it becomes an automatic that you go to the family bank you build business you go to college you do whatever but you keep the money rolling in house so that 100 years from now, 200 years from now, three, four, 500 years from now, it's your family. That's a conspiracy theory. It's your family that becomes a conspiracy theory. That's one of my goals in life. One of my goals in life is for my family to become a conspiracy theory. Yep, I said it, to become a conspiracy theory. That we have our hands in so much business and industry around the world that people will swear up and down that we are a part of some dark force, Illuminatus, uh, Bilderberg group that's ruling the world. Do I believe that there are people out there who are doing things like that? Of course there are. Of course there are power brokers moving the world. But I'm tired. I don't want my family to be a pawn. You got to upgrade your game on the chessboard, people. So that's what we talk about. Cigars and conversation. Building generational wealth. The truth. The truth a building, a family bank, and true generational wealth. Because I'm going to say this as the final thing, if you are not passing down the knowledge and testing it so that they are demonstrating the wisdom of it, you are not passing along generational wealth. Because those who just pass along land, who just pass along money, who just pass along business, Usually by the fourth generation, they have lost more than half of what the original created. So if you create a million dollar business, by the time you get to the fourth generation, you will have $400,000 heirs, $200,000 heirs. You'll have a family that goes to college that makes good money, but that's all you'll have. You won't have the eclipsing of what you accomplished. You won't have that. And that is true generational wealth and true knowledge, true wisdom, and true power. So I thank you guys for joining me for the first conversation of cigars and, of Smoking Phoenix Cigars and Conversations. We'll talk about subject matters, a litany of different subject matters. But I love this one because it can go across all my other channels. So you guys have a great day. And as I say on my Coach Rand and Lorenzo Reed channel, you gotta free yourself to be yourself because your greatness is non-negotiable. Good journey, good vibration. Put some smoke in the air.